SUVs. Everybody loves them and everybody is making them. And that includes Volkswagen, who a few years ago even coined the term SUVW. They did make a big push with those cars, but they also haven't forgotten that sedans are very important. And now there is this. It's called the Volkswagen Virtus. It is the second product from VW's India 2.0 onslaught. And it's available in two engines, the 1.5 TSI and the 1 liter TSI, both of which we have with us today. And we're going to tell you what they're like to drive. But first, while we're out here, let's take a moment to appreciate the looks. It's certainly grown a size compared to the Vento and unsurprisingly, there is a hint of the bigger Jetta in here. In fact, in almost every dimension, this is the largest car in the class. It's easy, of course, to draw parallels to the Slavia, but much like with the Tiguan, Volkswagen has gone for a bolder, more chrome-heavy look. The huge air dam in the front bumper is lined with the shiny stuff and makes a big impression. But the downside of this is that the small 16-inch wheels look even smaller. The big gaps in the wheel arches only emphasize this, but it does give the Virtus an SUV-like 179mm of ground clearance. There's more chrome in the rear bumper and this along with the large blacked out tail lamps do a good job of distracting you from what is quite a bulky rear end. The GT trim exclusive to the 1.5 TSI engine gets a few differences too like gloss black alloy wheels, a subtle lip spoiler on the boot and GT badging. Which do you like better, the VW Virtus or the Skoda Slavia? Let us know down in the comments. And if you're new here, why not subscribe to Autocar India and click the bell icon. We publish great new automotive content every day. Thankfully, they've done quite a bit to distinguish the interior too. The interior of the VW Virtus will be very familiar if you've ever seen the interior of a VW Tiguan. I should tell you right at the outset that this is a 1.5 GT with a red exterior paint and that means these red accents here on the dashboard. It's similar, yes, to the Tiguan, but they've done a slightly different treatment for this gloss black trim on the sedan and I like that quite a lot. It looks quite classy, plastic quality is generally very, very good, build quality is very solid, but like the Tiguan, there are a few bits that give away the cost cutting that's gone into this car. Things like the knitted roof lining that this time around at least does have a nice texture to it and some plastic bits that stick out for just being a bit too basic to look at and touch. The GT version gets black leatherette upholstery with red contrast stitching but what I like is that they haven't made the whole cabin black. There is still beige bits at the bottom on the doors and the roof lining which livens things up just a little bit doesn't make it seem too dark. Things that do return are this lovely new Volkswagen steering wheel. Uh, it's very well built, it's very handsome looking in my opinion and it has all the controls you need right here. It's also got the digital dials, they don't stretch all the way to the outside just as before, that's a bit of a shame. But what you get in the centre is quite informative, though I would have liked two round traditional dials. Another thing I'm not so much of a fan of in these cars uh, is the touch-operated climate control. It is a bit fiddly to use on the move. But on the subject of features, the Virtus, like its SUV counterpart, is rather well equipped. Top spec variants get a 10-inch touchscreen, 8-inch digital dials, wireless CarPlay and Android Auto, ventilated front seats, wireless phone charging and a sunroof. And though we don't have the variant-wise split yet, VW seems to have learned from the Tiguan and improved the features in lower models too. For example, you get LED headlamps even in the base model. There's a good chance you'll be chauffeur driven in this sedan, so let's hop into the back seat now. Now, Volkswagen says this is the largest car in its class and it's got a pretty long wheelbase too, so it's no surprise that in the back seat there is plenty of space. Now, I won't draw comparisons to its rivals just yet. We'll wait to get all these cars together for a proper comparison before I do that. But what I can tell you is compared to the car it replaces, the Vento, there is vastly more room back here. I'm just under 5 foot 8 and as you can see there's a lot more wiggle room for taller passengers in terms of knee room. And headroom, I think by standards of sedans, is rather good as well. There is a bit of a caveat though, these seats, very comfortable, very supportive, but they are contoured more for two. A third passenger can fit here, but 
it's a little on the uncomfortable side because of the raised cushioning and the raised backrest. You will like though that there are three individual headrests and three individual three-point seat belts for all the passengers back here. AC vents return, two Type-C USB ports. But one thing I do miss from the Vento is that lever that lets you push the front passenger seat forward for more legroom at the back. You don't get that in this car. A massive highlight of this car is the boot which at a class leading 521 liters, the same as the Slavia of course, can really swallow up a lot of luggage. And if you need more still, you can even split fold the rear seats. So it's good looking, practical and well equipped, yet somehow that's not even the best part. Oh no, that would be the driving experience. Now, as I mentioned in the start, the VW Virtus comes with two engines, a 1.0-litre TSI and a 1.5-litre TSI. That's much the same as what you get in the Tiguan SUV. The one I'm driving right now is the 1.5 TSI, 150 horsepower, 250 Nm of torque and a 7-speed DSG double clutch automatic. Now, unlike the Tiguan, this Virtus doesn't get a manual gearbox for the 1.5 TSI engine. Not right now, at least. It's not listed on their website, but Volkswagen does hint that it will be available by the time the car launches. And if the Tiguan and indeed the Slavia are anything to go by, the 1.5 with the manual gearbox will be the enthusiast choice. However, you can't really go wrong with the 7-speed DSG either. VW were, of course, one of the pioneers of the double-clutch automatic gearbox and although initial versions of it did have some issues, they've really come a long way and this one feels much smoother and much quicker to respond to inputs. And if you really go for it, the gear shifts themselves are, of course, instantaneous. Helping things along, of course, if you want to take manual control are paddle shifters behind the steering wheel and also a Tiptronic mode on the gear lever itself. Now this 1.5 TSI Evo from Volkswagen, we've seen it not just in the Tiguan but also in the T-Rock. The power outputs are very very healthy of course but it also has clever tech like cylinder deactivation which means that when you are on a light foot with the engine it will deactivate two of its four cylinders and help you save a bit more fuel. This powertrain also has engine stop start, so if you can bear with the AC cutting out a bit when you're at a traffic light, you will save a lot more fuel that way too. So while this car doesn't have full-on drive modes, what it does let you do is knock the DSG gearbox into sport, which makes it a whole lot more responsive. Flatten your foot and it will drive to 6000 RPM. In fact, it revs quite freely for a turbocharged engine and that only adds to the fun quotient. VW says this 1.5 GT will do 0 to 100 kph in 9 seconds flat and go on to a top speed of 190 kph. And with a relatively light curb weight of just 1275 kg, we feel that might just be the case. Incidentally, that light weight should also help with fuel economy and this 1.5 TSI with its stop start and cylinder deactivation tech is rated at a claimed 18.67 km per litre. On the dynamics front, the Volkswagen Group always does a pretty good job. They did a tremendous job of the Tiguan and we really rated it as our favourite driving SUV in its segment. And well, that only translates better to the sedan body style. The steering is really well judged for a mix of heft at high speeds and lightness at low speeds. It gives you a good amount of feedback from the road and it's also quite sharp, making this car quite a bit of fun around corners. But the real triumph of this dynamic package is the ride quality. This car has high ground clearance for a sedan and that's very good because of course it means you can clear large speed breakers without any worry. But just also the suspension setup. Yes, there's a little bit of underlying firmness, just as you'd expect from a European car. But it hasn't come at the cost of low speed ride. It rides on 16 inch wheels that do look a little bit small, frankly. But the upshot is that it allows this car to ride over bumps really, really well. 
And much like the Tiguan, that slight firmness in the suspension has allowed this car to behave really, really well at high speeds. Out here on a highway like this, at three digit speeds, it tracks nice and true, doesn't move the car around too much and will keep your passengers very, very happy. And even when you introduce it to a set of corners, it comes good with handling that is truly enjoyable. That suspension setup combined with the steering makes it agile, makes it fun and makes it really well controlled. Yep, this powertrain and this chassis, it is a great driver's package. The brakes too feel really strong. There aren't discs at the back but stamp on the pedal hard and it will haul this car down to a halt very confidently. So the absolutely tremendous 1.5 TSI is undoubtedly the driver's choice. But hold on, because the lesser 1.0 TSI might actually end up being the one you want to buy. So here we are in the 1 litre TSI version and much like in the Tiguan, it makes 115 horsepower, 178 newton meters. And here is made it to a 6-speed torque converter automatic. You can have this engine with a 6-speed manual as well, but we don't have that on test today. Stay tuned for that later. As the numbers suggest, this engine doesn't have quite the high-strung performance of the 1.5 TSI. And the gearbox, this torque converter, isn't quite as quick or responsive to your inputs as the DSG. So yeah, much like in the Tiguan then, this is the more relaxed powertrain of the two. But don't mark it down for that because I suspect, much like in the Tiguan, this will end up being the far more popular choice. The first reason is because, much like in the Slavia and the Kushak and the Tiguan, the 1.5 TSI version is likely to be quite a bit more expensive. To the point that only serious enthusiasts would want to opt for it. And the other more significant point is that the power and torque figures, though not as much as the 1.5, are more than enough by segment standards. For the majority of people, this car's more relaxed nature will be rather appealing. It's the better city car and I'm sure this car will spend a lot of its time in the city. Perhaps the only thing you have to be aware of is the torque converter's tendency to make the car leap off the line when you lift off the brake pedal. That aside though, it's a brilliant gearbox. Even though the 1.5's DSG gearbox has improved a great deal, there is a little bit of jerkiness in the shifts, whereas this one, there's no jerkiness at all. It is incredibly smooth with the shifts. It too gets paddle shifters if you really want to get a move on. And even the power delivery at low speeds and light throttle inputs is incredibly smooth with this powertrain. In fact, this 1 litre TSI powertrain only starts to show signs of hiccups when you push it a bit too hard. So it's probably best not to do that and drive in a more relaxed manner. For instance, even if you floor it in sport mode, the gearbox takes a second to respond, the shifts aren't quite as smooth anymore, and the engine starts to make that three-cylinder thrum that, so far, wasn't that audible. On the dynamic front, nothing really has changed, except that with less weight over the nose from this smaller engine, it actually feels a little bit more eager to turn in, which only adds to the sense of agility. Curiously, VW recently introduced the fuel-saving engine idle stop-start tech on the 1.0-litre TSI engine in the Tiguan SUV, which improved its fuel economy figure. This Virtus we're driving today doesn't have that tech, but still managed to score an impressive 18.12 kpl claimed rating, which will only get better if this feature is added later on. So again, for most buyers, this car will be more than enough. You don't need to stump up for the 1.5 TSI unless you really want that performance. Let's face it, at this stage there really wasn't much we didn't already know about the Virtus apart from the way it drove, which proved to be, as expected, the highlight of the experience. The only other missing piece of the puzzle now is the price, which going by Škoda and VW strategies with their mid-size SUVs should be right on par with the Slavia. We peg it at around 11 to 18 lakh ex-showroom. 
Without the might of its sublime TDI diesel engine, Volkswagen has really leaned into its TSI turbo petrol tech and delivered two stunning powertrain options to buyers, a relaxed one that suits everyday needs and a racy, powerful one for enthusiasts. The Virtus has a tremendous ride and handling package too, but what sets it apart from rivals is the way it looks, which takes the clean and understated VW design and jazzes it up with a bit of chrome and gloss black trim. The interior is spacious, comfortable, pretty well built and well equipped too, but there's no escaping the fact that higher spec variants will likely get expensive. One thing's for sure, these India 2.0 cars have been a huge hit with Indian customers, and the boost, pun intended, that the Tiguan gave VW sales is only going to get stronger with the Virtus.